today in collaboration with my favourite video game, World of Warships, which I don't mind admitting, once the kids are in bed, sneak downstairs and play for a couple of hours, we are going to rate the greatest battleships ever built. Yes, we are going there. We're talking battle wagons, the castles of steel, the greatest World War II battleships. Now everyone's got a favourite. We're all going to disagree on this. Let's keep it calm. Let's keep it friendly. This is just a harmless bit of fun. An expression that no one ever said about USS Missouri. Right, let's do this. I've chosen eight of the greatest battle wagons ever to plough the world's oceans. They're kind of random. They're just eight ships that I've got a particular connection with. And I've made up three categories and I'll be rating them best to worst. First of all, the most obvious category, specifications. They're kind of paper strength, so speed, armament, weight of broadside, all that kind of stuff. Secondly, their contribution to world history. Just what role do they play in the war? How important were they? And lastly, I'm just going to go with the gut, fear factor. How awesome are these ships? And I'm going to lay them out on this beautiful high-tech tier list. You recognize this. D for the worst, A for the best, but a special tier S if we feel that any of these ships are so iconic they need their own category. First of all though, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Let's talk terms here. Obviously, ships have been involved in war for as long as there have been ships or war. But for most people, when they hear the word battleship, they think of the castles of steel that fought in the great wars of the 20th century, the first and especially the second world war. Now, of course, there were armor plated ships going way back. There were some in the American Civil War. There were many through the late 19th century. And once you've watched this video, I suggest you go and check out all those amazing vessels. But for today, we're going to be focusing on the pinnacle of evolution of the big gun battleship. We're going to be looking at the giants that slugged it out during the Second World War. All of these mighty battle wagons were designed by a particular power to do a particular job, sometimes in a particular ocean or just stretch of water. So, of course, there are lots of compromises involved. I, I like to think sometimes of something like a triangle. You've got firepower, punch, how hard can a ship hit? You've got speed, how fast can it get in and out of action? And then you've got protection, it's defenses, the armor plating on the decks, the thickness of the armor belt around the hull, even the special compartments around the waterline and below it to try and protect against torpedoes. And you can't be perfect at all three of those things. So all of these ships fit somewhere on that triangle. Are they gonna be maximized for speed or for sheer punch? You might hear me get a little bit carried away and talk about classes of battleship. Well, a class is a group of ships built pretty much to the same spec, and they're named after the first in its class. Bismarck class, Iowa class. That just means that those ships were the first in a batch that were produced to a very similar design. Now, let's get into it. I cannot believe I get to do this as a job. First up, because we're going oldest to newest, it's the grand old lady herself, HMS Warspite. Built in 1915 at the height of Britannia's naval domination of the world, she's one of the Queen Lizzie class of super dreadnought battleships. She was revolutionary at the time, oil-fired rather than coal. She displaces nearly 37,000 tons, so actually she's the second lightest on the list. Her main armament was extraordinary for the time. She had eight super-firing 15-inch guns, each capable of shooting a armor-piercing shell nearly a ton in weight. Her top speed was around 23 and a half knots, which is one of the slowest ships I'll be talking about today, but that's to be expected. She's a grand old lady. She served for 30 years through the greatest wars humanity ever fought. Her resume, simply unprecedented. Nothing can compete. She was the Battle of Jutland in the summer of 1916, which is the greatest battleship clash in history. Her 13 inch armor took a pounding from the Germans, but she never gave up and she gave as good as she got. In the Second World War, she wrecked shot during the Norwegian campaign. 
she smashed a bunch of German destroyers at Narvik. Her float plane was the first aircraft ever to sink a submarine, a U-boat. In the Battle of Calabria off the coast of Italy, she managed to set a world record. She hit an Italian ship at 24 kilometers range. That hit persuaded the Italian Admiral to head home as quickly as possible. Slightly later in the war at the Battle of Matapan, she smashed some Italian cruisers and fundamentally changed the balance of power in the Mediterranean. She was part of the bombardment force that took the war to the Italian mainland in 1944 and helped knock Italy out of the war. She took a terrible beating in return, particularly from German aircraft, but she was pretty much unsinkable. On D-Day, June the 6th, 1944, Warspite was arguably the first Allied ship to open fire on the beaches of Normandy. She hit a mine shortly after D-Day, but that didn't stop her. So Warspite managed to survive 30 years, not only of some of the most extraordinarily intense warfare in history, but also a time of rapid evolution in war at sea. Warspite is certainly one of the greatest ships in the history of the Royal Navy, and that's saying something, if not in world history. As for fear factor, well, I think, like that Italian admiral, if you found out you're engaging war spite, you want to think twice. As you might be able to guess, I'm a big fan of war spite. I am British. I love the Royal Navy and its history. There are bigger ships on this list. There are ships that pack a bigger punch. There are faster ships. But there are few ships that can compete with the service that was rendered by HMS war spite. Come at me, but I'm placing this in S tier. Next up, it's USS Arizona. Built in a hurry, she was commissioned in 1916. She was one of a slew of super dreadnought battleships built to prove that the USA was now a power on the world stage. At the time she was built, she was regarded pretty much as the most powerful ship afloat. She's the lightest of the big battle wagons I'm gonna be talking about in this film. She weighed just 32,000 tons. But when it comes to big guns, she had more than any of the other ships. She had 12 14 inch guns bristling with firepower. She was slow, maximum speed 21 knots. Arizona served for 25 years. She stayed stateside during the First World War, but she took Woodrow Wilson, the US president, over to Paris, what we call the Versailles Peace Treaty. Then she went around the world showing the flag, flexing on behalf of the American government. From probably her most famous entry in maritime history is her tragic end. On the 7th of December, 1941, Arizona was alongside in Pearl Harbor, the base of the US Pacific fleet in Hawaii. A surprise attack by Japanese carrier-borne aircraft on the 7th of December destroyed Arizona after a catastrophic internal explosion. She still lies on the seabed of Pearl Harbor, a monument both to that day of infamy and the men who died aboard. It's an incredibly moving place to visit even today. I've been lucky enough to be present as survivors of the Arizona who died many years later of natural causes have asked for their remains to be placed alongside their wartime comrades. So how to place USS Arizona? On its own, it's definitely not the most striking warship on this list. It fired a much smaller broadside than some and it was slower, less well armored, but it did play a significant part in maritime history. I think this is BT. Next up, our first German ship is the Scharnhorst. The Führer himself, Adolf Hitler, was present when Scharnhorst was launched. He was proud of this ship, but I'm not so sure he should have been. Its guns are of the smallest caliber of any on the list. It has nine 11-inch guns, hot guns compared to some. 
It weighed in at around 39,000 tons, which makes it one of the lightest that we'll be talking about today. But it did make up for that in speed, 31 knots top speed. When the Germans built ships, they had to be able to run away at pace. Now I've got to admit, Scharnhorst does look pretty cool, but looks can be deceiving. Those bows were not well designed for the heavy seas of the North Atlantic. Time after time, she'd be plowing through big waves and ship so much water over those bows that she would flood her forward turret, making them unable to fire those guns. Scharnhorst did most of its best work in the Norwegian campaign of 1939. She did score a hit on a British aircraft carrier at extreme range. It does rival the world record of HMS Warspine, to be honest. So that was impressive. But later in the war, she was annihilated at the Battle of the North Cape. On Boxing Day 1943, the British battleship, the Duke of York, beat her black and blue, and she was finished off by some escort vessels. How are we going to rank Scharnhorst? Well, I'm not a huge fan, but to be fair, that hit on the British carrier was exceptional. And that, pretty much that alone, means that it scrapes in with a C. Next up, just to show how even-handed I am, I'm going to include a French ship, the Richelieu. This was a very, very slow build. In fact, it was commissioned into the French Navy a couple of days before the French surrendered to the Nazis in the Second World War. Bad timing. Around 45,000 tons, so very mid-table. Its guns, pretty big, 15 inches. It's only got eight of them. It's pretty speedy. It could hit 32 knots, and that's really why it was built. It was designed to hunt down the cruisers that Nazi Germany was building. This was never a super heavyweight battleship. Her engines, you'll be glad to hear, were made in Britain, so I'm giving her marks for that. Suddenly came word, the Nazis speeding to take over. As soon as the French surrendered, she steamed down to West Africa to a French colony with a lot of gold on board. The French colonial authorities then faced a decision. Should they just hand Richelieu, France's newest, shiniest battleship, over to the British and the Free French? Should they keep hold of it there, or perhaps they should even send it to join the German Navy? What would they do? In the end, the British really helped them make that decision. And the Royal Navy paid the biggest compliment they could to the Richelieu in that they went to great efforts to sink it. Richelieu, built to take on Hitler's cruisers, ended up firing its first shot at the British Royal Navy. In September 1940, at the Battle of Dakar, as the British tried to neutralize Richelieu and other vessels. Eventually, the French saw sense and Richelieu was handed over to the Allies. It went to New York for repairs. In all it served for 27 years, it didn't go back into service in time to play a part in the Pacific War. And it was part of the ineffective French effort to bring Indochina, Vietnam, back under the French Imperial wing. It's a nice looking ship. I like the layout, the unconventional twin super firing turrets up forward, each with four 15 inch guns. But it didn't really move the needle on global naval warfare. It's getting a C. Next up is the one you've all been waiting for. No list of battle wagons is complete without the legendary Bismarck. Bismarck's the most mythologized battleship in 20th century naval history. But before I come on to all that, let's run through the stats. She displaced 50,000 tons, so top half of our list. She was at the time the biggest battleship ever launched by European power. Bismarck mounted eight 15 inch guns, so by no means near the top of the list. Each of those guns could fire, say, an armor piercing shell weighing in at about 800 kilograms. Well, some of the big battleships we'll be talking about in a minute could fire shells well over a ton. It could hit top speeds of near 31 knots, so mid-table, nothing to write home about. Now, why does Bismarck have the greatest reputation of any ship ever built? Well, partly because the Royal Navy needed to big it up to explain the fact that Bismarck had scored a lucky and fatal hit 
on one of the Royal Navy's finest ships, HMS Hood. That had led to a catastrophic internal explosion in Hood that took it to the bottom, tragically, with nearly all its crew. The Royal Navy needed Bismarck to be this unimaginable super battleship in order to explain away their failure to upgrade the armoured deck on HMS Hood. It also made it sound cooler when the Royal Navy did manage to destroy Bismarck, which of course they did in May 1941. And that brings us to the problem with Bismarck. Its service history was less than 10 days. It went out into the North Atlantic. It destroyed HMS Hood, fair enough. It gave the Prince of Wales a nasty scare by hitting with a few shells, some of which didn't explode. But after that engagement, Prince of Wales was operational again within two hours. Eventually, Bismarck was hunted down and smashed by the Royal Navy. I'll grant the Bismarck this, it took a hell of a beating, but there's more to being a great battleship than staying afloat when it's on fire. So, how do we rank Bismarck? Am I biased? Yes, I am. But I can't help thinking that this is a ship with a reputation that far outstretches its actual real world ability to influence the war at sea. I'm afraid, folks, I'm giving it a D. Up next, it's the most monstrous battleship ever built. It's the Japanese Yamato. You run out of superlative to describe the specifications of this behemoth. It is the heaviest ship on our list. It displaces 73,000 tons. Its main armament is mind-boggling. Nine 18-inch guns. Its broadside, so the total weight of shot fired from its main guns, was twice that of Bismarck. <laughs> Partly as a result of that, it is super slow. It managed to hit 27 knots, which is slower than any other battleship launched at the same time. And its fuel consumption was horrific. In some ways, it represents the very pinnacle of big gun battleship design. It is truly awesome. The problem was that by the time it was launched, it was a bit of a dinosaur. I hate to say this, but these big battle wagons were being consigned to the history books. It was the wrong ship to do the wrong job at the wrong time for the Imperial Japanese Navy. It was unable to take part in the battle for Guadalcanal because of its enormous fuel consumption. Guadalcanal Airport the tiny patch of land for which Japan has sacrificed a fleet of warships and thousands of fighting men still bristles with United States bombers. It did stretch its legs and showed us what it could do on the 25th of October 1944 off Seymour Island in the Philippine Sea. It absolutely smoked the incredibly brave little US destroyer, the Johnston. Johnston, which looked like a toy compared to Yamato, was grazed by those big 18-inch shells and then had its superstructure smashed to pieces by Yamato's secondary armament. It took astonishing punishment. Yamato then successfully struck a US carrier and sank another destroyer. In the end, it had to retreat because of US air power. The next time Yamato was in the thick of battle, well, it was a suicide mission. She'd been instructed to head to Okinawa where a battle was raging for the island. There she would scuttle herself and just act as a giant gun platform. She never made it. Yamato was set upon by swarms of carrier-borne US aircraft. It took an astonishing beating. There are at least 11 confirmed torpedo strikes on Yamato and six bombs. Under these hammer blows, she sank on the 7th of April, 1945. It was said that the fate of the Japanese empire itself was tied up with that ship. And in fact, that turned out to be true. It is an astonishing piece of battleship design. The world will never see anything like it ever again. Yamato is a cultural icon in Japan, a source of enormous pride. The Japanese showed that they could outbuild the Europeans. They could beat them at their own game and produce an astonishing super battleship. But you just can't give an A grade or above to a ship that ends up getting pummeled to death 
ends up getting defeated and is sunk with nearly all hands. I'm afraid Yamato's getting a B. Next up, it is the awesome pinnacle of the USA's battleship fleet. It's the Iowa. Iowa was first of its class, commissioned in 1943, deep into the Second World War, and the Americans weren't messing. It displaces 58,000 tons, which is the second biggest on our list. It mounted nine 16-inch guns in its main armament. Not quite as heavy a punch as Yamato, but much bigger than everybody else. Its weight of fire dwarfs Bismarck's. It's well armored and its top speed was 33 knots. So she's big, she's powerful, and she's the fastest ship on our list. I've been on board Missouri and they proudly point out the tiny little dent where a Japanese kamikaze aircraft smashed into it and caused very little damage. Throughout the remainder of the Pacific War, Iowa's big guns made life very, very unpleasant indeed. In fact, untenable for many Japanese defenders from the Marshall Islands to the Japanese homeland. Iowa also survived a massive typhoon with very limited damage, a typhoon that was strong enough to sink and cripple several other ships. A violent typhoon whips at Admiral Halsey's third fleet as winds ranging up to 138 miles an hour for the second time in less than six months. Our fleet has been caught in a typhoon, common in the China Seas. Iowa came agonizingly close to really showing what it could do in ship-on-ship -ship actions when it almost intercepted the Japanese fleet at Leyte Gulf, but they just gave it the slip. In 1945, Iowa was present at the Japanese surrender in Tokyo Bay, flagship of one of America's greatest admirals. Bull Halsey. It went through periods of commissioning and decommissioning. It served in the Korean War, for example, and it was only finally retired in 1990. Alleged. This, this is one of those pretty simple decisions. Iowa is awesome. It's A tier. Now, how else are you gonna finish off a list of the greatest 20th century battle wagons? Obviously, it's gotta be the last mighty battleship produced by the US Navy. It's the Missouri. The same class as Iowa, so the same stats, nine 16 inch guns, extraordinary liquid filled compartments to reduce the impact of torpedoes. It was a masterpiece. It weighs in at around 58,000 tons, which also makes it second on our list of battleships. Like the Iowa, it's capable of hitting 33 knots. It's fast, it's powerful. It took part in those titanic clashes at the end of the Pacific War. It bombarded Iwo Jima, providing essential fire support for the US Marines who were fighting so hard ashore. It bombarded Okinawa. It hit the Japanese home islands. And its importance is reflected in the fact that the final Japanese surrender, the end of World War II, took place on its deck in Tokyo Bay. Cameramen and reporters of many countries record this historic moment as United Nations military leaders crowd aboard the Missouri and examine souvenir cards bearing the Japanese flag, special mementos of the occasion. Swarms of United States aircraft fly in formation overhead as the ceremony ends. The final United Nations victory has been won. The war is over. Peace is here. It fought in the Korean War. It was decommissioned in 1955, but was brought back into service in the 80s. And those big guns roared again off the coast of Kuwait during Operation Desert Storm as the Allies drove Saddam Hussein's Iraqi army out of Kuwait. It is an iconic ship. That's why it was selected by Steven Seagal for Under Siege.
This beautiful ship, the Missouri, it's S tier. Thanks for watching folks, I certainly enjoyed it, hope you did too. Please like and subscribe, and obviously I'm expecting you to disagree with me, to take me on. Let us know in the comments, what do you think this list should look like? Which ships did I leave out? What was I wrong about? And if you want to join me playing the epic World of Warships, all you got to do is click the link in the description. That gets you a code to unlock some fantastic bonus content in the game. And I'll see you out there on the high seas.